I'm in the Open University. Again, yes. And I'm in Tim Jordan's office. This is Tim Jordan's book with an axe on. It's called Hacking. And this is Tim Jordan himself. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, you've written a book on hacking. There, I have it's right here. Books. I have the evidence in my hand. Is it available well, online as well? It's available. No, it's not available free online yet. The publishers <laughs> are not interested in having it hacked at this stage. <laughs> it is available as an electronic book, but you'd have to pay for it. Unless gotcha. You, unless you get a hacker to release it from its informational prison. <laughs> Let's just film free. every page really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> but what kind of developments have there been in hacking at the moment? Well, hacking started off with really two big arms. One is cracking. People who take computers, break into them, do what they want with them, move on. The other one is free and open source software, which is people who make software programs, who write them, release them free and open source, and which means that you can access the code, and if you're another coder, you can change it yourself. In the last perhaps 10, 20 years, developments in hacking have really led to two main groups emerging that weren't there previously. Hacktivists, which are politically motivated hackers, they're people who, for various reasons, want to intervene and use hacking to change the world. So they're people who write bits of software that allow us to, to pass information securely, particularly for um, human rights uh, activists. But also what we've seen is cracking coming much closer than ever before to the criminal world. So we've seen a lot more hacks that border on cracks in order for financial gain. So the two big changes in hacking, politically motivated hacking, and an emerging connection to the criminal world that has never really been there in a big way before. I'm really interested in hacktivism, not personally like I do it or anything like that, but I'm very interested in cryptography becoming a little bit more user-friendly. Um, something that we could all have access to because sometimes we, we don't want everybody reading our cookies and reading our emails and reading our data. Absolutely. The one thing everyone should know about the internet is that it's nothing is secret on the internet. Everything that you do on the internet is recorded by someone somewhere. So if you want to do anything on the internet and not have people know, for whatever reason that might be, you need to get involved with the kind of tools that hacktivists provide and that various programmers provide to allow secure identities. And these might be things like um, being able to send information securely. So there's a program called Camera Shy, which allows people to embed information in pictures and put them on a web page. You can then, if you've got the right password, read the information. Everyone else sees a picture of a fluffy pony. Fluffy pony. <laughs> Strange things. Like Strange animals. They cross between ponies and bunnies. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> Other people might see a fluffy bunny. You can see the information that you might want as a human rights activist or for other things. So there's a whole range of tools out there now. Some of them are hard to use because they're meant for people who are politically active and engaged and are willing to put the time in. Some of them are much easier to use. Something like the Tor Network, T-O-R, which means... I'm sorry, I don't want to tell you what that means. The Tor Network, which allows people to securely um, surf the web, is a bit slow. It won't download all your pages exactly, but it will anonymize your, your access. The and Onion it, Router. I have it on the my onion Mac. Router, it's really right. easy to download, yeah. really easy to install. Um, I just, just keep forgetting to click on it, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the interesting question in some ways is not, are all these tools available? Because cryptography is pretty easily available. Nearly all browsers, sorry, nearly all email programs will have some kind of cryptography involved. And if you get away from the major corporations and particularly use a free software or open source one, you'll usually be able to choose pretty strong cryptography. It'd be very hard for someone to break. How do you feel about Google now being kind of a, this is a little bit of conspiracy warning, let's put a little banner at the bottom. Woot, woot. Google investing massively in Firefox at the moment. Well, it's an interesting thing because free software and open source has never been something that doesn't like big business. In fact, open source was invented as a term to get away from the political connotations of free software in order to get business more involved in the production of this. Free and open source software at its heart is a technique for producing software and a technique for allowing software to become better and better. So its politics are all about better software. They're not necessarily about you know, freedom and, and other things that might be implied by the term free software. That's brilliant. Um, let's summarise very quickly. Here's your book, Hacking. What measures do you take to protect yourself? Um, I use Linux at home. I use Firefox, disable all the pop-ups. Using Linux means I'm protected from 99% of all viruses and other things because they're all written for Microsoft because everyone uses a Microsoft computer. So my recommendation is the Linux desktop is here. I write about hacking. I'm not a hacker myself. Linux, you can use on your desktop. Better, faster, free. You heard it right here. And if you want to know a little bit more about this kind of stuff, there's a book, very simply titled. But if you do Google this, be warned. You're
probably be flagged. Um, <laughs> just Google Tim Jordan. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Cheers. Thank mm-hmm. you.